Okay, then welcome everyone to the third lecture on deep learning for NLP. And there's some good news, some bad news in the beginning. So lasagna is already outdated. Uh, so it's still last Monday. Uh, sorry for the confusion, but I recommend you to to use Keras. This is really annoying. I hope it's not disturbing too much that you cannot see the sides. So go to, to keras.io and install it. When you have pip installed, it's really easy. You say pip install keras. And on the next slide, I will you explain why lasagna is like old school and keras is hopefully a bit better. idea how to fix it. Ah. It took us a while to get it figured out. <laughs> A lot of smart people in here, and everyone with a PhD, so... There's always more than one solution. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so why should you use Keras? As mentioned, there are like four different libraries which build on Teano. Uh, Lasagna is one, Keras is one, Blocks is another one, and OpenDeep is the fourth. I have no idea about the other two, but um, what I did is like some runtime comparison uh, on the named entity recognition task. And I wrote an implementation by myself and it takes like uh, five seconds per iteration to train. Same implementation with Keras takes like nine seconds and with Lasagna it takes 16 seconds and I thought okay 16 seconds that's way too slow so when you run like it on bigger tasks or on large data sets it, it gets really really tedious to train. I tried to figure out why Lasagna is so slow but I couldn't figure it out um, typically all the implementations are quite easy, straightforward, but it can be in the details. So how do they, for example, compute the error function? This can have like a big impact if you put some, some um, intelligence into it, how to compute the error function in a quick way, because you know, okay, it can only be a single label, so you can disregard all the computations for the wrong labels, for example. Also, what had a, had a big impact is changing float uh, 64 to float 32. So by default, Teano used float 64. And as you can see, the runtime for lasagna takes around 30 seconds when you use float 64. And when you reduce it to float 32, it reduces to 16 seconds. Um, similar results for Keras and you do not lose so much. So precision uh, is not so important. So precision in the digits is for a deep network not so important. So float 32 is, is fine from pers uh, precision point. And when you can train twice as fast, I think it's a nice speed up. You can change it by configuring it in Teano RC and you set like right global float x equals float 32 and then Tiano uses by default um, float 32. So it's not so important for today. I mean 16 seconds is still okay or also 30 seconds is okay. But when your network gets bigger you need also to optimize for performance and these are like also interesting things to do and keep in mind. And also these libraries are quite nice but as you see you get not the best performance 
And when you say, okay, it takes too long, maybe it's worth to implement it by yourself and see if you can be faster than the networks. Okay, last week there was a question by Richard. Um, does everyone need to build deep neural networks or can I just use existing networks and can my work look similar to Weka? Um, so my theory, so it's a non-expert speculation by me, don't count on me if I change my mind next week, is that they are going to fear for be four classes of contribution on future conferences, uh, assuming deep learning will like uh, keep state-of-the-art training. So the first one is like generating human insight into tasks, so no deep learning is required. So I don't know, when you work on argumentation mining and you want to study how do men argument compared to women? Uh, I think you do not need like deep learning. You can do not need machine learning at all. Also, you can invent and describe new tasks. So also there, no deep learning is like required, but you should still apply state of the art approaches. Otherwise, uh, or as me as a reviewer would say, okay, why is he using such a bad naive base classifier and not like using state-of-the-art approaches, which could work better. Then what you see right now is a lot of adaptions of existing network architectures for other tasks. So use network X for task Y. You see a lot of papers in this area. So for example, predict the number of calories from a picture. And they use just the same network as predict, is it a cat or is it a dog on the picture? Um, there you need a fair to good understanding of deep learning. Um, I think these are not so interesting, the papers, but you find it on a lot of conferences uh, because it's quite a new field. And the last category is create new network architecture for existing tasks to improve performance. Personally, I think these are the really interesting uh, contributions because you, when you have like a new network architecture, you can use it for a lot of tasks and get your performance increase to a lot of tasks. So the network architecture is not limited only to, to some tasks. For example, Zoha, he, which we, he presented an approach in architecture, recursive architecture, which we will talk about next week, um, which works for a lot of tasks. So it works for sentiment detection, it works for semantic reasoning, for textual entertainment, for question answering, and so on. And that's just a single application or a single new architecture he, he presented in 2011, 2012, which can be used in a lot of different fields. And I think these are like the really good contributions, but there you need like large expertise in deep learning and machine learning. So I would say in general, it shifts more into back into the machine learning field. So back in the nineties where it was all about feature engineering, I think my theory is now more getting into the, the machine learning field again, that you need a good understanding of the machine learning. Any questions on that? So just mention it's a speculation by me. Uh, we will see how it turns out. Okay, so did someone try to, to do the homework and to play around with the MNIST data set and the two implementing? implementations provided and what were like your findings on that or your insights <laughs> no insights sorry okay so I don't know I don't have insights so I didn't do the play around but typically what you can see it's like it looks a bit arbitrarily what gets out. Uh, so when you run it f several times, you get different results, which is like depends on the optimization. So you have an error function and you do the gradient descent, but the gradient descent find, does not find the global minimum, but always like local minima. And these can be like really different from time to time. So it's if you test different architectures, you sometimes need to average over different analyzations. So you initialize your network for, I don't know, 100 times randomly, and then you compare the one architecture against the other architecture, and then you see, okay, what's on average best, and is the average better, significantly better than the other one? Because 
changing that initialization gives you sometimes good performance boost, sometimes it doesn't increase your performance. So I have a question, is it like the, the one practice, which is written in the papers, because at the end you have one number, and so we need this and this and this, so yeah. is it like the best, uh, best practice to do that? Or? <sighs> no, uh, so what I see in the papers is just we present one number, and as people are focused on publi publishing, they typically will take like the best number. But so it's I would not say it's good research, but it's like, you know, all the problems in the research, okay, people are focused on numbers. And that's also why I like the last thing where you create a new network architecture, so where you can really see, okay, this is like something new and at this or this contribution Okay, he gets an increasement, performance increasement of 0 0.5 was not due to like a better random initialization of it. So, but it's not seen so much paper. So some papers, uh, one paper I will show you next week or um, on autoencoders where they did this. So they also run it on the MNIST data. So it's a really nice paper where they compared different architectures of it, so how many layers should it be, um, should, how is pre-training employed, and they average it over different runs. And then you can see you have a box plot, and then you can see, okay, is this um, significantly better than the other one, but it's not common practice. And yes? There are some methods like, you know, to get away from this local minimum, yeah. like simulated annealing, etc. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. So there's something which is called momentum when you do mm -hmm. stochastic gradient descent. Um, so the problem is when you have like when you do gradient descent, it goes always to like the mm -hmm. local minima when you mm -hmm. s think of a shape, mm -hmm. and then you can add a momentum, mm -hmm. which is like I don't know the ball runs down the hill and then it has really high speed and when there's just a small valley it will jump out of the valley mm -hmm. until it and then you hope that you can surpass bad local minima mm -hmm. but you never find the global uh, mm -hmm. minimum of it okay. because the, the space is just too big so when you have like one million parameters to train or the mm -hmm. the, para the the network I showed you last time from Google had five million parameters so finding the global minimum in a five million dimensional space is like impossible. Mm -hmm. But often you, the global minimum, people assume is not so much better than local minima. So the difference is like really small, typically. Okay, so for today, um, I will put the recommendation and the slides online after the class. So. I think lecture two and lecture three of the Zohar class is really good to explain how wet to vec works. Then what we will cover today is also um, the theory of Colobert and Weston, natural language processing almost from scratch, which is also a really good paper to, to read. Then of course uh, we will talk about word embeddings and when you talk about work, work, word embeddings, you should know the work by Mikolov, word to vec there are two papers online or several papers online. Then there's Pennington et al. who use GLOF, Global Vectors for Word Representations. Then there's an interesting comment on word to vec versus GLOF. So the first version was like GLOF is not better than word to vec And then the people from the GLOF updated the paper for the final submission and then the restriction was rejected. So GLOF is better than word to vec but in the meantime, or during the time, people thought, okay, GLOF and word to vec is not so much difference. And one paper which is also really interesting is from Levy and Goldberg, a dependency-based word embeddings. So instead of just taking the context, the words to the left and the words to the right, um, they use dependency links and train it on dependency links. And their embeddings is are quite different. So the embeddings there, they capture better um, syntactical similarities and word to vec captures better or when you train it on the context captures better semantic similarities so for example when you have the word Hogwarts um, 
similar words when you train it on the context is for example Harry Potter and Voldemort and Dumbledore for example uh, when you train it on the dependency links um, to Hogwarts would be similar as Mordor from Lord of the Rings for example because these are both places and it can be really interesting also for your tasks so all the tasks built on top of word embeddings uh, what you need more so do you need more semantic similarity then you should train it on the context or do you need more syntactic similarities then you should use the de de uh, dependency links for example then there's one really strong reading com recommendation um, from Goldberg it's currently in a draft version um, so it's like a 60 page paper on all kinds of um, of how is deep learning applied in NLP, so what is like state-of-the-art approaches, so the introduction um, or neural network architectures here talks about what are like good networks for different uh, for different tasks, so when you say okay you want to do sentiment classification then you can search here for sentiment classification at some point um, you find okay it's or here when you see you want to do dependency parsing you want to use recurrent models and then you know have some hints on it and there's also chapter on feature representation so how is your input encoded um, there is a chapter on feedforward neural networks the most basic one how are they used there is Word embeddings, chapter on word embeddings, also a really important concept. There is, should have like a table of contents, neural network training, so what are like different training modes? So there's for example stochastic gradient training, but there are also uh, beyond stochastic gradient descent, so what are like approaches which can improve it? And I think there's a final chapter on like, I don't know, how to initialize your weights and so on. So cascading multitask learning. So it's it's a really nice paper. Um, also when you really want to say, okay, you want to go into detail and want to have a better understanding and what are like the important aspects you need to tune for NLP, um, really look into this paper. Okay, so I hope everyone watched the video on word to vec and word embeddings from Richard Socher. Are there open questions on word embeddings, how word embeddings work? Where they don't work? Yeah. So, so you must have one point that if, if it's like king minus man plus woman. Yeah. Yeah. But then if, if the words have uh, multiple relations, they usually don't work. That's what you mentioned. Correct. So, I mean, one, one issue is that when you have like ambiguous words, for example, star, which is like the Hollywood star and like the sun. And then the word embedding is like something in between between these two meanings. So it's something between like the sun and the Hollywood star. And when you then, then do relation, so I don't know, the sun maps to moon like, I don't know what, what's on, then it doesn't work when you don't have like them big, or solve them big issues here in this. And typically for most tasks, I think it's not necessary to resolve them big words because you use typically like 300 dimensional word embeddings that's like common practice and best practice on the dimension part and there you have enough dimensions to also cover it in this direction so making the work and resolving the big words and trying different embeddings for the different meanings it's possible but it's not really feasible for most tasks and most tasks they just say okay in star we have all the different meanings included in the embedding and then the later network will figure out, okay, what's like the meaning of star in this context.
Further questions? So softmax is a nice function as it gives you a probability distribution. So it gives you an output between 0 and 1, and when you sum it up, it sums up to 1. And you usually use softmax always as the last layer when you do um, has some classification task because then you can interpret it directly as probability distribution. And for the layers between, you s use either the tangents hyperbolical function or the re uh, relu function. Does it answer your question? Okay. So you, you should avoid the sigmoid function. Sigmoid functions is bad and evil. And there's one paper on it why it's talking about why the sigmoid function is bad, especially in deep networks. So in shallow networks, you can use the sigmoid function. It's really popular, the sigmoid function, in like, I would say, in old machine learning and neural network papers. But in 2000, I don't know, 10 or 12, Glowit showed a paper where it says, okay, the sigmoid function is really hard to train in a deep network. And there you use the, should use the tangent superbolical or the relu function, recti uh, rectifier linear unit. Okay, more questions on word embeddings? No. So I hope word embeddings, the concept is, is quite clear. So just to, to sum it up, the training, what they do is. Um, they take a word or every word in your vocabulary is gets a random vector and then from the vector you try to predict like the context words so in the original papers of word to vec you take the words to the left and the words to right and you try to predict them and when you make an error you you minimize the error okay how far is your prediction away from the correct answer um, then levy showed okay you can or you're not limited to only predict the words to the left and to the right but you can predict arbitrarily words so you can follow dependency links and try to predict what are like the words in, on the de dependency links and this really change changes what your network is learning so you can put into it anything what you can think of so where you think okay these relations or this context would be really interesting so you could also learn I don't know you have a word and then you learn what are like my part of speech to the left and what are the part of speech to the right or what is the part of speech in my dependency tree and then you get like words or words which have like a similar part of uh, part of speech context are put together close in the vector space and <coughs> It's it's well well written, well implemented in word to vec and also in the GLOF implementations. There are existing tools, so there's the word to vec website. Um, I don't know who who have already used word to vec. Okay, yeah, around half of it. Um, it's straightforward. You input it. You input like a text file. Um, one sentence per line, one to uh, the tokens are separated by space. So keep in mind that you like separate space there and then you just train on it. So the original implementation of word to vec only runs for one iteration over your corpus. And what you can change in the C code is just to, is that it runs for more iterations. So then you typically get better embeddings. What you also see in the Soha, um in the Zoha video that you get like, or it converges after some iterations to a certain performance. And so I would recommend to, to run it on several iterations. And then there's Doctovec. Um, here you find the, the link of the implementation. So Doctovec is similar to Word2Vec, but instead of learning like word embeddings, it learns embeddings for whole documents. So, so you have like an identifier in your sentence, like a special token. And this special token is trained to predict your document or your sentence. And then you can say, okay, this 
special token is a representation of my sentence. And then you get like similar sentences are mapped or uh, this is really annoying. Um, similar sentences are closed in the vector space. Um, Mm -hmm. Just some note on the paper of Dr. Vec, so they show really good results in the paper, uh, but these results were not reproducible, and the author just vanished in this co-supervisor, I think it's Mikolov, yeah, said, yeah, I have no idea what my student did there, and I'm not also not able to reproduce these results. So the actual results people would try to reproduce are a bit worse than in the paper which was published. So also note, okay, how, how, how good is our publication method? And then there's the tool GLOF. It's, it's also there to run word embeddings. I would say it's like the best tool to run it. I never used it, but from, from what people see and what people did in the experiments, gives you like the best word embeddings. And there is implementation or adaption of Levy and Goldberg for Word2Vec, uh, where you can train it on any context you want, uh, which is also a really nice tool and really straightforward to use it. So this is good. So you do not need to implement it by yourself. And it gets even better. So there are existing word embeddings. So for German, last year we trained some word embeddings for German, which you can download from the website. For people who work on English, I think most people work on English, there are three sources. So there's the word to vec website. Uh, they have two data sets. One is trained on Google News with around 100 billion tokens. And then there's also one trained on Freebase vectors. So Freebase is a knowledge base where you have different relations between words and you can also train your word embeddings, of course, on these relations. You can download it there on the GLOF website, you find different data sets. So for example, on Wikipedia, with 6 billion tokens, on Common Crawl with up to 840 billion tokens, and also trained on Twitter. And on the Levy website, you find the dependency-based embeddings on the English Wikipedia. And you can, for English, I would say it's not worth to train your own word embeddings for English. Um, just download them, use them, uh, try or check what, what are the best embeddings for your tasks. If you have like, really special needs, so you 
work on fairy tales from the last century uh, with a special accent implemented it so then you maybe need to implement your own word embeddings or train your word own word embeddings so just to give you an impression so what you typically find you find a lot of numbers in there so how does a word embedding look like so you have Typically, well, the common format, I would say it's used in the levy and also in the glove. They use this format. But to vec use a binary format, which gives you smaller file sizes, but it's not so easy to use. If you need a converter from binary to like this easy to read and easy to understand format, just send me an email. I implement a converter for it and will also put it online. And what you find is like the token as the first position and then a lot of numbers representing the vector. So here you see the first entry is unknown, the second one is padding. In this case, these are special tokens unknown for words which are out of dictionary. So you say, okay, this is not in my dictionary, I use the unknown. And for padding, you can use it when you need a word which is outside of your sentence. So you will see it in the name entity recognition task, how padding and unknown works in there. And then here you find the embedding for comma is like, and then the embedding for dot is like, the embedding for der, so it's for German, is like this. So a lot of numbers uh, in there, which you can read into with Python or Java and compute, for example, the cosine similarity between a, uh, a dot and a comma. And then you know, okay, how similar is a comma to a dot, if you want to do that. I think that's straightforward. Then um, this is the input format when you want to train the word to vec uh, of Levy. Um, so this this is the file you put into the Levy tool, and the first column is the word. So here I trained it for prefixes, I want to have like embeddings for prefixes trained on the context words. So I do not want to have word embeddings on the context words, but I want to have like an embedding for a prefix of size 6 based on the context word. And here the first prefix is Scali von Skalieren. And then I put the context words, here I used uh, L-1 for the position, so one word before was diese, one word after was sind, two words after völlig, three words after this word, unabhängig. And then it goes on to the next word in your sentence, völlig. And then three words before are diese, two words before are sind, and then the word after it's unabhängig, and so on. This is like the input you give to the word to vector from Levy, and then it trains you the embeddings for this, this column. And what you put into there is totally arbitrarily so I don't know you want to have word embeddings for words then you, here you put your words and then you would want to train on the next noun you find in your sentence then you would put here the next noun in your sentence and what you can also do using this prefix and um, decide should it be um, do you want to use a back of words or should the context information also included so should the word before included into the embedding so is it important that diese is like one word before your target word? If you want to do that, you can encode it like this. If you don't need this, you, you just leave it. So then you just script them away. Yes? So did, can this file be incomplete? I guess we have windows for each word, and then you produce the context words for the right column. Mm -hmm. Suppose that we cut this, you know, half uh, this uh, file half and just input it so it's it's not checking anything about this consistency of the context etc no so you this can input whatever you, want. you you can input whatever you want to so whatever you like to you can input here and then it trains embeddings for these words and embeddings for these words so when you watch the video you know word to vec and glove always trains two different embeddings. So one embedding is trained on this, on the target word, mm -hmm. and a different embedding on the context words. 
read to vec, the original tool outputs only the embeddings for the target words. The glove vector does adds those embeddings, so it's a sum between this one and this one, so it works when you work on context, for example, and the levy tool gives you the output independently for both um, for the context words and the target words. So you see the embeddings for the target words. Um, levy dependency based context, so we have like two to outputs, we have levy dependency based words and context. And here you see the embeddings for the context words. So here it's that he used train it on dependency links, putting the dependency relation as the first argument and then the as the second argument the word. So here we have um, the article B. And this is the embedding for the context. And then we have down here a p, so it's a p relation for comma, and that's the embedding for okay. You have the link in your dependency tree, and there are like also for a dot and so on. So these are like the most common um, words you have in your document: the comma dot and. Yeah, it, it really depends, or you should think of, okay, what do you need? What do you want to train? How can you train it? So, and these are really nice three tools you can use, easily use and train your own ideas in it. Um, in most networks you will see, or in all, most, yeah, expect for maybe character level uh, networks, which were published this year. In all networks we use word embeddings, and it's like the core feature. So your network really depends on like good word embeddings and having good word embeddings increases significantly your performance. So it's nothing where you sit there and say, yeah, I just yeah, let word to vec run and take my word embeddings and then I'm happy and do not care about it. But I could re recommend you that you spend some time on your word embeddings, thinking of your word embeddings. What do you need? Uh, what is the right structure to train it? So I, do I need like the information in it? So the ordering of my back of words or is do I don't care about that? And which one is hard to tell in the beginning? And there's also a lot of tricks in it. So for example, in the word to vec, they strip off of stop words. So the and I am are not implemented or not trained in the embeddings you find here on the word to vec website because they do not add a lot of semantic information to it. And in other, so in the glove, for example, it's implemented or included. So when you need an embedding for the and for I and M, and this is an important information for your task that, I don't know, there's an I or an M or the and N and so on. This is an important information because you maybe want to count, okay, is it one item or two items? Uh, you cannot use like this embeddings because they're the stop words are removed. Um, the levy dependency based embeddings are better in capturing syntactic similarities. Word to vec and glove are better in capturing semantic similarity. This is my impression. And for your task, you need to think of okay, what is more important? Do I need more semantic information? So, for example, when you do named entity recognition, their semantic information could be more important. And in other tasks, um, the levy implementations are more important. Selecting the corpus, possible pre-processing and fine-tuning of the parameters can have a huge impact on the quality. So, question? Yes. Um, <coughs> how straightforward it is to combine those things in the training? Say, I want to train those in the context and the dependencies, can I just put it to the training file at the same time and get something new for out, or should I train like two separate you, you, you can do both. So what you de define as context is absolutely up to you. You can define it or you can put both into it. I'm not aware of anyone tried it, so I do not know if it gives you some meaningful information. I haven't seen combined approach. But when, we, when you see also from a linguistic perspective, okay, this could be right, really interesting. 
when you capture like the local context and also like the dependency context when you say okay this could be really interesting from your linguistic background you can try it see it does it work Other questions? Yes? Uh, more of a general question. I have to say first that I didn't watch the, the Sanford lecture yet. Okay. Um, but, uh, so, what I got so far is that uh, the training actually builds this dense vector space in which words are mm -hmm. close to each other when they're similar in meaning. Correct. But when you said when we want to measure the similarity between words, you said we would take the cosine similarity. Mm -hmm. And for sparse vector representations, this is obvious because. For instance, when we have frequencies, we are interested not in the length of the vector, but in, in its direction, more or less. But yeah. in this uh, dense vector space, wouldn't taking the cosine simil similarity be more harm than good? Mm -hmm. So it's so you can do use both Euclidean or cosine similarity, and there are also papers which do like a weighted something between these, and the res results are really similar. So if you take cosine similarity or you clean in distance, does not imp have so much impact on your similarity measure. One advantage of the cosine similarity is like um, it's normalized, so you can get a score between minus one and one. And with a Euclidean distance, you it's like an open, so the distance is between zero and infinity. And when you input this further into your machine learning task. So assume you do some manual feature engineering and you need to compare two words, how similar are two words. You need to normalize Euclidean distance because it can get infinitely large and when your machine learner is not normalizing it, uh, you're, you're, you're screwed. But in general, the, the impact of changing it is not so big. And in most tasks, we do not sit there and say, okay, now compute the cosine similarity but we just throw the embeddings for the words at the neural network, and the neural network does whatever it wants to do with the embeddings and gives you the output. Okay, so the so. dimensionality in this vector space is also not bounded, so we can end up with infinity in one of those dimensions. Mm, yes, mm, yeah, typically they are like... I would because in yeah. the file it looked more like mm -hmm. it was bounded between minus that. one and one. They, they, they are bounded in general, so so I mean in theory Euclidean distance is not bounded, but the embeddings you have here it's bounded, I would say. But I do not know what's like the range. It depends on the machine learner. What is? So we, we set this. We, we no, you you bounds, you don't find set the bounds, find the bounds. It's implemented or hidden in the implementation of word to vec and glove for the training. So. But I do not know what the bounds are. So. But good question. Thanks. Further questions? Okay. Is there any, uh, like I think you said, right? Is there any limit in dimension where, uh, where, I mean, uh, we could use these uh, uh, similarities? I mean, for any kind of. Uh, any kind of task. I don't. Are there any papers which are reporting uh, the pressure on dimension? Oh yeah. So there's like an internal evaluation where they do like um, this three or four tuple pair. I don't know. Berlin relates to Germany as Athen to, and then the system should answer you Greece. This is like the evaluation of word embeddings. Uh, which is also under criticism if this is like good evaluation or bad evaluation. And what people tried is like different dimensions, so take 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions, and for this task of these like having three words and finding the missing fourth word, 300 dimensions are optimal. So after that you do not get a performance increase anymore. But for your specific task, the size of the word embedding can really depend. So for some for some tasks, you need can use really small word embeddings, with, for example, only 20 dimensions. And when you have, like, of course, less dimensions, less parameters to learn, so you need less training data. So it's a trade-off between training data you have and the dimensions you can want to use.
Okay, so if you train yourself, um, select the corpus. Selecting the corpus has a huge impact, so see the papers from Glov and Mikolov on where to vec, um, what they learn. So if you learn, for example, on Wikipedia, you get more broad um, information into your embeddings, so on more broad topic. If you just train it on news documents, uh, it's more fine-grained. Also, the meaning can change if you um, I don't know, in your training corpus tr talks about Paris, the city of France, um, then it has more like the meaning of the word embedding of Paris, but when you then switch to a discussion board of Paris Hilton, um, the meaning of Paris would be different in this context. Also, pre-processing, what people do is typically remove stop words or, or not remove stop words. So Mikolov say removing stop words helps to capture semantic information. Um, pre-processing can also be, do you, do you want to convert everything to lowercase? So do you do not care about casing, could also improve it. And um, what was the last one? Uh, correct digits. How do you how to deal with digits? Do you say okay? Do you keep all the digit information, or do you replace it? Okay, here I found a digit, and if this is two thousand one, two thousand two, two thousand three, I do not care. So because you want just need the information, there's a digit, and more training data, larger corpus helps. So here you see the sizes which they trained on it. So and it's a really fast implementation. So. Um, just train on it so your training data should have some gigabytes of size I would recommend okay final questions on word embeddings I have a question I mean, um, you said that the Euclidean distance can be infinite yes infinite yeah. yes yeah. but in this scope of work yeah. can it be I mean, no it, it cannot be in the uh -huh. So, I mean, you have only like fixed number of embeddings and it cannot be oh. infinite. But the problem is when you then, I don't know, when you compute the Euclidean distance and put it into some machine learner, so mm -hmm. I don't know, let's say to a support vector machine, mm -hmm. you still need to do some normalization. Mm -hmm. And you would need to know at implementation time what is like the max Euclidean distance, where do I need to, to cut off. And it's hard when you test it with different embeddings. So, for example, one embedding, I don't know, let's say you use the word to vec embeddings, they are maybe more dense, so closer. Mm -hmm. And you use the glove, which are like more spread out over the space, mm -hmm. which does not really change anything on the embeddings, but the Euclidean distance changes. And mm -hmm. when you train it on the one, or you tune, you manually tune it on the one mm -hmm. setting and then change it to a different setting, mm -hmm. you need to retune this again when you use Euclidean distance. When you use a cosine similarity, you do not care about these effects. But as mentioned, when you put it into a network, neural network, you do not compute Euclidean distance or cosine similarity. Mm -hmm. So it's more like for playing around or just use it in some other way. Okay, now we come to our example. Named entity recognition. So people who know the Zena paper or NLP from scratch could be maybe a bit silent so other people could start to think of how to design a network for this task. So given I have a sentence, Peter loves New York, it's so big, and I want to do part of speech tagging. So Peter is a person and New York is like, these are two tokens uh, encoding a location. And now the question to you, how do you design a network, a neural network for this? What is your idea? So that my neural network gives out, okay, I found Peter and I found New York as named entity. Who has an idea? Huh? We need embeddings. How do you use embeddings? Lucy? <coughs> yeah. Or maybe you you can use a flip chart to draw it. Your idea. 
So how how is your network design looks like? Oh, network. I'm interested like. what the embeddings. Yeah. Embeddings okay, embeddings to the left, to the right, maybe. Mm -hmm. But but. So what about content? So you take some context like word, so for embedding word minus two, embedding word minus one, and maybe embedding more content. Don't let anyone look here and feed it into your other input layer. Yeah. Would you like to draw it? So we're good. Uh, Richard, what are you also? Yeah, okay. go on so we have like word where to the left where to the right how do we get our final label for it or our final sequence labeling for this Richard? the network we are going to do so um, people uh, what, two questions at the back yeah, so I finish uh, we will come to that what makes what makes sense makes it complicated so what is the network design going to look like? Um, so the first problem, so we have two problems. First of all, a sentence has like a variable length. So this is why one problem as mentioned, feed forward neural networks need like fixed sized input and gives you like fixed sized output. And then you have like this strange label sequence stuff, which is complicated. So what, what, you do. I try to draw on, on the computer. I have no idea if it works. Maybe I switch to the flipboard. Um, so what you do is you use a trick. So you say you have some target word. Let's say Peter. Let's say Peter is our target word. And what you then include is like so the word before, then the word Peter. And you have Peter. And you have the word loves. And then the first problem is like, okay, here it's like empty. So what we put here is like our padding. It's not really working, I switched to the flipboard. So you take the target word Peter and then you enrich Peter. So use the word loss. And here you say <coughs> heading. So you, you invent some special token which is like, okay, this is part of scope. You could say also, okay, this is like begin of sentence or sentence or heading in the beginning of the sentence. You have the same problem at the end of the sentence that you need to say, okay, this is at the end of the sentence. And <coughs> then what you do, so this is like your word. 
for each context and for each. So this is the context, this is the target where you do a look up in your worker settings. And then you go down here and this one. And whatever. So when you say the size of the embeddings is 100, and here you use a window, it's also called window approach of three, here you have like 300 dimension. Correct, you will concatenate them. And you have the room layer. And you have the hidden layer, so for example, you start with 300 dimensions. For the hidden layer, you just do 100, just because I don't know, I like 100, so I always start with 100 for the hidden layer. And then for the softmax layer, you need to count how many outputs there are. So if we only consider person and location and go for no named entity, these are five different labels we can assign with like for beginning and I for intermediate. So we have like four, uh, five dimensions as an output. So this is done independently for each word? Correct. And you do this for each word. So you start with Peter. You create this, adding Peter loss. You feed it through your hidden layer, mm -hmm. through your softmax layer, and then you get some distribution. So how, how likely is Peter a B person, how likely is Peter an I person, how likely is Peter an O, and so on. And then you move to the next word, you take loss, you do the same, you take the word to the left, the word to the right, feed it through your network, and you get some probability distribution for your labels. And the question, or is it directly to that, Emily? Well, I was wondering if you could explain um, the, the, the first layer, you know, the way you can make together the do you, do you really just like take the individual embedding for padding and the individual embedding for Peter? Correct. And just like stick them together? Or yeah. how, how do you stick them together? Let's you you, you just stick them together. So you say this gives to the first 100 positions, this gives to the second 100 to 200, and this gives from 200 to 300. So you just compare to that. Is there a Sorry? Is there a for people? No, it's not really trigrams, but it's just like you know, three words, so it's a back of three. So it's not like training one for like a trigram, but having like this three and then it's the three words. No, and in, in this I mean, what you can do is increase the context, the window size, that you not only take the one to the left and one to the right, but here you have a padding and then Peter loss loop, for example. You can increase the window size. I, is it the order of the concatenation? Like, so the difference between padding Peter loves and loves Peter padding is literally the, the you can concatenate them in, in the order they come. Yeah, you should concatenate them in the order they come. Okay. Because so loss has Peter as the first position. So then when you do input loss, here you have Peter loss loop. And you should not change it like in between the arbitrary confirmation, but say okay, the first word embedding goes to the first position, the second word embedding goes to the second position, the third goes to the third position. And then your question how to to embed like further information, part of speech or casing information. What you can simply do you take Peter. And then you
So your input is adding pita loss for your words, and you can do the same as part of speech. So take the part of speech to the left, which is adding, so it has no part of speech. And it's a noun, and it's a word. And you do the same. You have here. You have some lookup for the embeddings, or some lookup um, for the part of speech. So you have some dense vectors for your part of speech. Then you have them together, and then you just combine them. So you concatenate these. So instead of 300, let's say, I don't know, here you use always, let's say this is 30 dimensional, so you use 10 dimension per part of speech. And in total, you have like a 330 dimensional layer. And you can do it with any feature you want to include. So, what Colobert does in NLP almost from scratch is to include the word, the casing. So, he removed the casing here and then says, okay, Peter is uppercase, lost this lowercase, and no part of speech, just casing of the words. So this, for example, first step information, is it specific to these words? I mean, this probability that Peter is a noun, something like this? Or is it something general that applies to all the nouns, all the words, etc.? I mean, in the repository mm -hmm. we have some word embeddings for yes. postcards. Correct. They are standard, so yeah. we use them. It's yeah. not specific to these words. No, it's not specific to these oh, okay. so, so you don't need to them. No, so mm -hmm. the question is how do you get the embeddings for part of speech? Mm -hmm. You can either do pre-training, use word to make on part of speech, and then mm -hmm. similar part of speech are passed together, or whatever you like to do. Or you choose them randomly, and then train them during the training of the neural network on identity. So typically these are pre-trained, because you get a lot of information out of them, these are randomly initialized. Mm. Or you can also say, I don't know, I want to do one hot encodings here, twelve different part of speech, so you encode every part of speech as a twelve dimensional vector, mm. and you do one hot encoding. So that when you have a noun, the first entry is a one, all other entries is a zero. When you have a word, second entry is a one, all others are zero. So this mm. is you can choose it for your architecture. Okay, so the second question, yes. Well, so, so I can keep um, um, putting, so I have this, 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 this input layer, so I have my uh, 300 dimension uh, embeddings of the words, and I have my 30 dimension embedding from my speech type, and I can keep adding um, my embeddings from and my choice of uh, features that I want to use. What's the, what's the limit? What's the word is that when you problems? Um, so I just keep keep happening on. Mm -hmm. So first problem is runtime. Uh, so I don't know. You don't have a supercomputer. So when this layer gets too large, the runtime is like infeasible. And also when you increase this layer, or also the words you put in the context, you increase the number of parameters you need to train. So here you I don't know when you have like 100 dimension in this layer. So you have 100 dimension here, then the number of parameters are 300 times 100, so it's 30,000. Mm -hmm. uh, when you increase it to 600, you have like 60,000 parameters you need to train, and to train 60,000 parameters, you need more training data. So that's the two limitations, runtime and how much training data you have. Do we lose a problem about where we could take the Depends. How, how large is the training data, how complicated is the problem. Okay, the second question is like for sequence tagging, how to pass it on across the U? Uh, yeah, okay. so mm -hmm. right now we don't make any use of the information that, that given a person has the probability of an out of Yeah, yeah. Uh, they would Correct, so... Um, so this is the simple approach, also called isolated tech criteria. So you do not look at what is to the left, what is to the right. And then there's something which is called sentence tech criteria. So you have Peter. 
and then you have got So this is the five-dimensional output of the softmax and probability of the different classes you could assign to Peter. And then you do the same with loss. And you do it for every word. And what you can then use is a hidden Markov model. So you say this, these are the observations you receive. And then you do put a Markov model. You do a hidden Markov model, you optimize your hidden Markov model, and then you say, okay, this is a This is person, and this is O, and this is the location. And then, so you have your network, you have your hidden Markov model on the output of your network, and then you optimize the, the Markov model. And the nice thing is here, it's not two independent steps, but this is just further layers. So when you do backpropagation, you can do it over your hidden Markov model and update all the weights. So it's not something what is fixed here, but what you include also do. So you see, okay, the problem was maybe here I use a bad part of speech embedding, which causes this node to fail and this node to fail cause this node to fail. So this part of speech embedding will be updated. But to implement this is not easy, so it's not nothing straightforward. Um, this isolated track criterion where you just look here and then take the most probable output works, but it can also give you a wrong encoding. For example, it says new is not beginning of location, but an intermediate by location, and then you have an I location, I location, and this is not valid BIO encoding, where you say, okay, new entity starts with a B. Well, you could just strip off the, this um, B encoding. That's what you could do. So the network still thinks, okay, new is like pi, and then you click the strip off, re encode it. What? You can strip off the B and the I, and then just re encode it. You can sequences of the same type and re encode it. Of course, you will lose some information. So if you have two immediately adjacent ones, um, you merge them into one and other. Correct. So when you have the sentence Peter loves York and in your training data there was always talking about New York, um, maybe encode it as I location, then you could see okay this is an invalid tag, just re encode, put a B there. So to do some post processing. When you use the hidden Markov model, this typically cannot happen because in the hidden Markov model you see okay there can never be an I tag following the O tag. Okay, any questions on that? I think we can concatenate new and the out from the network. Sorry? New out, we can concatenate with some other score or something like that. That's correct. Wait. So, in the web to vec embeddings from which are provided on the website, they concatenated named entities to single tokens. So they trained an embedding for new, they trained an embedding for York, and they trained an embedding for New York, which is with an underscore. So, but that's really special about the provided word embeddings. You could also do this, do some pre-processing, say, okay, I know some, some, um, some named entities, but it runs also to you know, some problems which you would not try. So, for example, you have the sentence, Peter loves the New York library, and which is like not the New York library in New York City, but it's a new library in York. 
And when you then concatenate new and York, it will think, okay, this is the location, but it's not like a location. So I, w I would not do this, do some post-processing, just raw, working on raw tokens. What do you mean with concatenate? In which level? You were saying new part, right? Yeah. But new here is a big mention of lower case, it's not related to memory. So we don't combine them, but. Do you com mean combining or pre processing? Or? Combining new and new. Yeah, and in which level? And combining these here, yeah. the different yeah. lookups, or in the pre processing where you match it to one token? In the pre processing. Okay. Yeah, you, you shouldn't do that. So I would not apply or try to minimize your pre-processing because here you screw up your pre-processing and then, of course, your network screws up. Okay, enough on this. Now we try to implement it. And you find in the code repository some implementation, a lot of boilerplate. And I would recommend to use uh, the Keras implementation. I just gonna so most of the code is like how to read in the data, how to compute the F1 score, mm -hmm. and stuff like this. And so it's nothing really fancy, nothing really complicated. But of course, it's work you need to do for your data set and which has nothing to do like with deep neural networks. So, so what we, we implemented is the window size. We say, okay, we set it as parameter here, two to the left and two to the right. Um, it's, it's a parameter you should tune during your training, so what works best, window size of one, window size of three, or four, or five. Then the number of hidden units, as mentioned, I like the number 100, so I always choose 100. You have a train file, you have a dev file, and you have a test file. And then we do some, we do um, reading in the embeddings. So here you the embeddings is provided, it's like in a format like this. So it reads in the embeddings, um, it's just normal uh, Python code. So it takes the word, it's at split zero and puts the embeddings there. So there's just one node on the embeddings, so the embeddings can get really large, the size, file sizes. So they can get several gigabytes of size reading in all the embeddings into your model. Yeah, I mean, when you read an, I don't know, five gigabyte file of word embeddings, you need like five gigabyte of memory, um, which is not feasible. But for most cases, you do not need all the word embeddings. I mean, you can look into your train, test, and development set, what are like, um, what are the words I have? And then you can reduce it and say, okay, I only read the embeddings for these words and then it gets only, so here, you find here the term eval vocab. These are only the words or the embeddings for the words which are in training, development, and test set. And these are like, I don't know, 40 megabytes of size. So you only need like four meta, 40 megabytes memory to read them in. Just as a trick, uh, so do not try to read in all, all of them. And there are also um, so two two tools I put you into. So there's a create word list which reads in the text and outputs with what are the words I find in my text. And then there's a file create subcorpus which reads in the complete data set or the complete word embeddings. Looks okay. Do I need the embedding for this word and extract it? And so. 
setting up or initializing your network gets much faster. Then we cre create a mapping for our labels. So we have like the O label, which we say it's index zero, and then we have B and I and person, location, organization, and other. And then there are three more tags for main class person, derivative of a person, and partial information of a person. So this is specific to the data set. And we just put here our, okay, our label. So we map O to index zero, then B person to index one and so on. Then we read in the data. So it's just C, uh, CSV reader reading the tokens. And we create some NumPy errors, which I can show you here. Um, so create NumPy errors. So we have the padding or the index for unknown, and we have the index for padding. So these are like two special tokens we need for unknown words and for the padding words. And then here we go from Windows. So we have our target word, and then we take the words minus window size to plus window size. So two words to the left, two words to the right. Check is the word in our word embeddings, word to index. So this is to look up. Okay, this is the third word in our vocabulary. And then we add it to the word indices. And at the end, we get a matrix, which looks like So this is just a mapping from the word. So padding has the index one of our embedding matrix. Peter has uh, uh, position 127 and loves 2873. So what we just used is uh, this as an input training data. So we do not work on words, but for our new network, we give this information. So what is the line in our embedding matrix? And then the first lookup is like embedding at position one, and then embedding one. And this is our the embeddings for these words. Question? So Correct. So, what you need to hold in memory is like all, so all words which appear in your training development by your data and your training development test set. Um, I mean, you can of course hold in your complete vocabulary. So. You take all the word embeddings you have trained from word to web, but these are, as mentioned, quite large or can get quite large. And what you can do, or when the complete vocab, uh, the complete matrix is too large, then you need to work on the list lookup. And when you run it on Barney and you say, okay, my embeddings file is two gigabyte in size, it's no problem. It will call two gigabytes into memory. But when you run it on your local machine and you need to read two gigabytes from disk and to load it into memory, uh, take some time, which is like a waste of time when you only need like 100 different embeddings because you have 100 different words in your data. And we also append to the label to this one and from this So we have an X matrix, uh -huh. which looks like this. Yeah. So this is like X is then one, seven, and three. So this is the first row, and the second row is like then uh, three, and then again, uh, one. 
So this is the six matrix. Mm -hmm. And showing your training data, and then you have the Y matrix, which gives you the label. So mm -hmm. the first label is person, and we map it to one. Second one is no, we map it to zero. Third one is e location, it's a, I don't know, let's say it's a four. I don't know if it's a four. Mm -hmm. That's like the two. Structures in it. And the function just gives you this information. When you run it, it looks like um, read in the vocabulary, read in the data, and create matrices. And then we see around 1.3 tokens are unknown, so 1.3 tokens which appear in our training data, development data, and test data are not covered by our vocabulary. So one out of 100 words is like not known. This can also be, you should check how many words are unknown because it can be to, when you have a really high number that you do bad pre-processing. So for example, the embeddings you have are all lowercase, but here you input like also uppercase words, or you have a different to tokenization. So you create, take embeddings with the different tokenizations as you use it for your training data. Okay, so, and then we have here our matrices. So, as mentioned, when we look at train X shape, so we have 450,000 rows and five dimensions. No. So it's, it's I just copied the NEA Kera skeleton pi. And you can either copy it to iPad notebooks, so just take this and then create a new iPad notebook. Or just use your local Python uh, to run it, so Python, whatever you have. Okay, here you see our training matrix. It's like 400,000 rows, so we have five, uh, 450,000 tokens we have for training, and for each one we have like five input. So if we plot the first 10 numbers, we see, okay, one is our padding, this is the target word, and then we always see how it shifts to the left. So 202 is the, like the word here, loss, and then it shifted over and this is our training data. And we do the same for Y, which is our label. So the first one is in 1. These are 0. This is label 7. And that's how we prepare our data. And then now we want to use chaos and not lasagna. And I need to see what I need to do here. Okay, so what we do is like, we have our input, it's two times the window size plus one. So when the window size, we take two to the left, two to the right. So we need five input. Number hidden units and number outputs units are the number of labels we have. And we want to train it for 10 iteration, mini batch size is 35. And the embedding size is like, we take it here from our embeddings matrix. And here we have like our x as input and y as output, but I think they are like not really do. And now this is all like pre-processing. It's like tedious, and as you done, as soon as you've done it, you can do the interesting part. So there are like in Keras, there are two models. There's a sequential model and there's a graph model. Uh, where is this? So a sequential model means, okay, we go from layer to layer. You can also think of like complicated graphs, which I shown you from the Google image where you have like different inputs, different outputs, which can also model with Keras. Embedding.
Okay, the first one is our lookup. So we want to map our these indices to one to the like the first row of our embedding matrix to the 127th row to the 2873rd row. And we need uh, embedding for this. So we need an embedding lookup. In Keras itself, there's an only like dynamic embedding implemented. So what they do is during training time, they update the embedding, so they move towards in different direction. But what makes the um, training really, really slow, it takes like 900 seconds when you update also the embeddings during training time. So what I created is like a fixed embedding file, which you find in Keras layer for fixed embedding. So I just copy pasted the embedding style and said here, I do not want to update the weights. Is it clear a bit what it's mean? So it's, not it's not doing backpropagation on the embeddings. So you can say for your embeddings, you want to do backpropagation so that these embeddings are also shifted in space, which has advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is So when you do, I don't know. So you want to do an entity recognition, and you have like Google, Twitter, Microsoft, whatever, and then you have Apple. And it's Apple is like more on the food corner. So it can be useful for your training. So when you have like news articles, they cover you when they talk about Apple. Once Apple, or is it like the company? And then it makes sense to update your embedding and move this work more into this direction where you have all the locations. And then you say this is like. The problem when you update your work embeddings is like, I don't know, you have Blackberry. And when Blackberry is not in your training data, the embedding will stay in the fruit corner. And of course, then if we'll see Blackberry, okay, in this case it's like more fruit, I will not change it. When you fix the embeddings and you say, you do not allow to move them around the space. You say, okay, these are companies, and maybe these are companies also. And then you don't, even when you do not see BlackBerry in this context, um, you still can classify it as a company because it's close to like Apple, and Apple is a company. So does it mean for giving my accounts of data? Yeah. In my data, in my old data set, I can uh, initialize the embedding just randomly and let your network learn embeddings in the past. Correct. Yep, you can initialize them randomly and learn it during uh, this. In the Colobert paper, there they do a remark compared to a random initialization versus pre-training, like word to vec, word embedding style, and it gives good performance increase in named entity recognition. Do you have it pre-trained or not? when have it pre-trained. So it gives a really good Amazing. performance increase several percentage points in F1 measure. Carsten? Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, basically it's doing, not doing the same thing as we would be doing here, and just on the different data set, right? Yeah. If you do updated embeddings to your model training, you adapt your embeddings to the current training data. So it does do the new data. The data. Yeah. Yeah. So the task is pretty good in pretty good past the pretty good context. So mm -hmm. for any different yeah, yeah, yeah. Not really the same thing yet. So and the recommendation is when your data set is small, uh, have the word embeddings fixed. When you have a large data set and you can ensure that all training words or all words you have in the test set also appear in the training set, then you can update your uh, word embeddings. Yes, question. So, uh, will it be feasible to use fixed 
embeddings for the words I've seen and then just for unknown words create random embeddings and update them as I go along? Uh, I mean, the problem are words which appear in the test set but not appear in your train set. And I mean, when they come at test time, you cannot like create a new word embedding and train for it. I mean, so there are words which are like unknown. Yeah. Okay. You you can still do that. It's it's it depends how how big is this number. So here it's like one percent of the words are not known, and you could create word embeddings for these, but often these are like misspelled words or like problems with tokenization. There are also some in the data set, some Arabic words, Chinese words, whatever, due to wrong encoding problems. And if you see a word just a single time in your training set, you need to ask, okay, does this word it will appear in your test set? And it will not appear in your test set, you do not need like word embedding for it. But of course, when you have a really different test, a uh, really different data set, then you should create new word embeddings for these new words. So as mentioned, when you have the embedding layer in Keras, the implementation is not so great. It's not really feasible. So I used the fixed embedding, which does the lookup of like our indices to our embeddings. And the parameters are like output dimension. So you have embedding shape one. So it's like the, the first dimension, also the second dimension of our embeddings matrix, so it's 100 dimensional. Input dimension is the number of words you have. we have in our vocabulary. So I can just print it here, maybe. So we have 100 dimensional vectors and we have 76,000 words. And that's the size of our matrix. The input length is the number of uh, integers we're going to present so in our in this case is it like three integers and the weights uh, is our embedding matrix and that's how we get our lookup then the next layer is called flatten so this does a look up for all our inputs so for all the three words we put into our embeddings layer and with flatten we concatenate them to one single a 300 dimensional vector and then we have output. so we we take our the next one is a dense layer so a hidden layer with the output dimension is like the number of hidden layers, activation functions, we take the tangents. And then we have our last layer, it's model at dense output. And then we say we have softmax layer, and the output dimension is the number of output units, so the number of labels we have. And then I need to... Okay. That's all we need. Then we need to compile our model, to compile our piano function. So we define a loss function. It's a categorical cross entropy. So here we can define what we want to use as an error function. So we use the cross entropy error function, which is like in our case identical to the negative log likelihood. 
and as optimizer we can put like stochastic gradient descent here on different algorithm which is called Adam so there are different algorithm implemented to, to, for training and then we need to do it some one trick so this is special about Keras. So it's as in, in our vector we have like the label we want to have. So it's like label five, label six, label seven. But it requires that you have like a one hot encoding. So that you when we when you have ten different labels that you don't have a Y vector but a matrix for Y and that the label which is correct there's a one and for all other there's a zero. And with this you can convert like a vector to this matrix. Where? Yes. Utils. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry? Ah, train. Train one. Correct. And I think that's all we need to do. Let's see. <coughs> I'm just gonna run it and probably there's some some problems so here we see okay reads in the vocabulary reads in data and creates the matrices here we get our statistics for the unknowns and now we get an error I'm sure we get one okay now it compiles the function it takes some time it starts to train training and then we see okay it took 21 seconds for training and it has a performance of 65 F measure after the first training after the first training instance and then you will see it will get better over time so you have 67 and that's pretty much so this is like all you needed to implement to have like this network which does isolated tech criterion so we have our embedding layer then we have our concatenation layer we have the dense layer for our hidden layer and we have the dense output layer with the softmax function and here we say as optimizer we use the atom which is like it was published 2015 this year and claims to be really good and you do not need to optimize the parameter. What you can also do is like do stochastic gradient descent. So if you want to do stochastic gradient descent, you can set the learning rate. Let's say we have a learning rate of 0.1. You can set a decay of 1 minus 6 so dk is over time you reduce the learning rate so that you find really the bottom point of your, your valley then you can define your momentum so should it flip or should the ball spring out of a local valley and then there's a parameter nestor of which uses Nesterov as momentum. So it's a special way how you have your momentum. And then we can say as optimizer, we do not want to use Adam, but we want to use SGD. So here we see we get an F measure of around 70%. And if we want run it with SGD, we just started here. We say, okay, this is our optimizer, the stochastic gradient descent. 
with these parameters you can check okay how should I set my momentum should I enable it disable it should I start with a large training rate learning rate versus a slow learn uh, small learning rate and then you see the output of it and that's all it needs to implement like this layer or this this for named entity recognition using word embeddings and the deep neural network for like the easy model with isolated tech criteria so no sequence information used Questions in this part. So we try to make it deeper so anyone uh, anyway, we can try to make it deeper. Um yes, just let me terminate. How do I say? So if you want to add another layer, you just go here and say model at let's say okay we take 50 and activation really and then we can just run it and see what works. So now we added one layer with 50 and activation function rectify a linear unit and then you can see okay how, how does it work in comparison to like only one hidden layer and you can also try different activation function different optimizers and so on this hidden layer I mean, I would say this hidden layer does not really improve it. I don't know. So it's it's really similar, so 65. So in general, more hidden layers and deeper hidden layers let you capture more complex nonlinear relations. So if you have a really difficult task which has like a lot nonlinear uh, relations, for example, question answering. So you input your question in text to your network, and this is like a really complicated nonlinear thing. So I don't know what is like the biggest city, which is was formerly known as something, but is now was named after a famous president. And then it's like a really nonlinear thing, and m adding more layers allows you to capture these nonlinearities easier. And here you see it works, so performance is quite similar to that. Question on that? Sorry? No, it's de yeah, it's decreasing to avoid overfitting typically. So here we have 100, here we have 50, and here we have, I think for the task, 28. And there are different, there's a lot, and the documentation is quite nice for Kera, so there are like different optimizers, stochastic gradient descent, Adagrad, Ada Delta. AMS prop and Adam. There are like different objective functions, so you can have mean squared error, mean absolute error, mean absolute percentage error, squared hinge, hinge, and typically for single classification we use, or well, in most cases we use cross entropy as it's like the best error function. But sometimes you can also use like mean squared error. And there are different models, so sequential model where you go one layer to the next layer, or you can also get like a really abstract graph model where you have like different intermediate connections in the graph can have several outputs in it. So if you want to, I don't know, have an output in between in a deeper network, you can use it with the graph model. 
different activation functions. So always use what we use as softmax, tangens, relu, different initializers and regularizers. And what's like interesting are like the layers we have. So we have different core layers, dense layer, it's like fully connected. Outer encoder, we will talk about that next week. We have layers which only apply an activation function. We have dropout. Um, dropout just erases some of your data, which sounds really stupid, but it's really helpful. So it just erases 50% out of your training data, which makes your model more robust. So when it can only train on 50% of the input, and it's randomly erased, it cannot like go the easy way and say, okay, I just see this pixel and I know when this pixel is activated, it's a nine. We have reshape, flatten, merge layer. We have convolutional layers different for different dimension, like convolutional and max pooling. We have recurrent layers, advanced activation layers, and so on. So a lot to do. Or a lot what you can work on. Yes. Richard. Correct. Um, so it makes me wonder why you think, why you now like Keras more than Mazenda. Yes. Oh, this, this that, huh? <laughs> That's just the reason. So I don't know, lasagna was kind of slow. Okay. And I'm not happy with like slow solutions because, I mean, 60 seconds you say it's okay, but then it quickly increases. And when you take for one iteration, five minutes, and for the whole training time, like four hours, you get really pissed off and say, okay, uh, this is too slow to like fast prototype. You saw, okay, you need to do a lot of like small experiments. Should I select 100, 200 in layers? Should I use stochastic gradient descent or Adam? And so quick iteration time is important. That's the one thing. Second thing, what I see, I think Keras is in the recent, so in the last months or in the recent past, more active than lasagna. So there are more commits on it. And it's, I think what I see from the documentation also more extensive. So it has more features implemented, like layers implemented. But it's a disadvantage from my point that you, or it's harder when you need to change something, when you need to change, for example, which parameter should be updated, it's harder in Keras than in Lasagna. So for example, I wanted to avoid that my embedding layer is updated. So I need needed to create a new class to implement the fixed embedding. And in Lasagna, I can just say, okay, do not update this parameter, and then it's done. So, But performance was the main reason by Keras, but I think it would be really, val really good if someone tests the different implementations. So there are four different libraries, uh, which one is the fastest, which one is the most extensive one, and which one is the easiest to use. I mean, um, I think it's because people still do not know what's like the best approach to tackle this. Uh, there are like new libraries popping out, but after some times it will settle and there will be like some clear, clear winner. So we we'll say, okay, this looks like the both most suitable approach. So, I mean, in the right now it's a disadvantage because you need to see, okay, what's good, what is what is also, which is maintained better and which has a better documentation. But at some point I would say, okay, it will settle. And Azania and Keras are the most popular on GitHub. And um, so I tested them and I think Keras, as mentioned, is faster and also has more 
stuff implemented, which makes life a lot easier. I mean, you've seen how easy it is like to write these six lines of codes to have like named entity recognizer, which you can also use for part of speech, for chunking, for event extraction, and basically all word classification tasks you have. Okay, further questions? So if you want to, to have an exercise on on Keras, a quite good exercise is you can try to extend this model to not only include the word information, but also to include casing information. So uh, as shown with the part of speech information, you can do with casing. So here the word embeddings are all lower cased, but of course is the word upper cased or is it all upper cased is a really good information which we stripped out of the word embeddings and just try to extend your model so that you um, use the casing information. Richard. That casing are a good feature? I mean, what we did, or the embeddings were only trained on lower cased words. So here you only input or you say all your input is like lower cased. And mm -hmm. So what you can do is like train your word embeddings without lower casing, which has advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is it can capture different meaning between lowercase and uppercase words. So for example, German word Rasen, when it's uppercase means driving fast, when it's, uh, not, when it's uppercase means like the green outside grass, when it's lowercase means driving fast. And by normalizing them to all lowercase, you have like the same meaning for it. But when you don't lowercase, when you keep the casing on your word embeddings, you also increase the number of words in your vocabulary and you increase the number of training data or where you need to train the word embeddings. So it's it's really trade-off and it's a long discussion, should you lowercase or should you not lowercase it? And for this particular case, we decided to lowercase them. So you need to, so in this case where we say we have lower cased words, you need to implement the input and the casing. So you need to implement some function which detects the casing and maps it to some embedding. So you still need to implement that. This happens at the beginning. This happens at the beginning, so. I mean, you at somewhere you need. I mean, the network needs the information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we want to have a layer 
which have a couple of layers which should be able to somehow mm. implicitly uh, recognize parts of speech that we never actually talked about. Yeah. So part of speech, um, the foundation is our word embeddings and like words with a similar part of speech are close in vector space. So all nouns are in one corner, all verbs are in a different location of the vector space. And the network does not sit there and say, hey, part of speech is a great information. I tried to learn part of speech, but it just looks at your vector space and what you're asking for, what to do, and then it can learn something similar. So it learns that words are s in a similar space are all per, uh, person names. Words in a different location of your vector space are like um, company names, for example. So it's something kind of similar to part of speech, but you do not tell the network explicitly, learn part of speech, and it does not come by itself, hey, part of speech is a great concept. I will learn part of speech for it. But adding part of speech you can add from an external tagger part of speech information into it. But if you have good data, good word embeddings, you do not need it. So you do not get any benefit from it because it already the, all the information you need from the part of speech is already in the word embeddings. You can do that, it's called pre-training and we will cover it next week. But you typically do not do it on like part of speech but on some other target function. Last question, big data. Uh, so how, how well will it scale to the thousands tons of gigabytes of terabytes of data? I mean this particular implementation, can you try it or this one? Say, say I have like uh, a mm -hmm. terabyte of data. Oh. Or okay, half a terabyte. <laughs> Yeah, might, might take some while. So in general, these operations are quite suitable also for larger data sets. Um, not in terms, I mean, so what Google uses it, it trains it on like millions of images. Mm -hmm. And also Baidu, for example, trains it on, I think, 100,000 hours of speech. So when they do speech to text, they train it on 100,000 hours of speech. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. With this framework, um, or no, with I don't know. So they use either Cafe Torch or some C implementation, but it's from performance-wise similar to Tiano. Mm -hmm. I do not know what's like the difference between Tiano and Kera. So how big is the difference of it? So I have not enough. There's a chance it will scale. It it has. I mean, it Should scales linear. Well, so it's with such. So there's no support for distributed computation and when Deep Learning for J tells us it's like a nice marketing gag because training it on a distributed way is like really difficult because you have one model and all the param parameters in your model are influencing the output. And you cannot, when you split the data into like two parts and run it on two different machines, the two models on the two machines diverge. So the one model learns something in this direction, the other model learns it in a different direction. And what you do is a lot of synchronization steps. So you train it on the first half of the data, train it on the second half of the data. They train it for one iteration and then they need to do some synchronization. But the synchronization, the network connection is a huge bottleneck. So when you use Ethernet, it's way too slow. Also, when you use high band with connection between computers, also way too slow. And what you need to do if you run it on distributed machines, you need to do a lot of engineering to get the synchronization. So you need to have a trade-off between divergence. So how much can I allow my model to diverge? and how big is the latency due to the synchronization step. So there is no easy, I have 10,000 machines, I take my model, throw it to 10,000 machines, run it, but you spend months or weeks on how to do the synchronization, what is my infrastructure for it, how good is the connection between the machines.
I mean, it's it's really difficult task. So also the people at Google do not say, okay, yeah, we, we so they have some experiments run on sixteen thousand cores, and it's nothing like it's nothing straightforward. So it's a lot of implementation where you also need to take into account how is your model and how is your data. And so there cannot be a generic implementation. That's the one point. Second point, people do not go into the distributed, but go to like GPU computation. So a GPU is 140 times faster than a CPU. And what people do is like then distributed computation on GPUs. So what they use is like two GPUs per machine and then distributed over like two to four machines, which just makes it... Yeah. Correct, but between two GPUs in the same machine, it's much faster synchronization as between machines. And use when you go to more machines, so like to two machines with each two GPUs, you still need the synchronization, but which is like quite difficult to do. So, but there's no easy way to just say, okay, I have a big cluster and run it on a big cluster, and it gets much faster out of it between of, uh, because of the synchronization step. Okay, then thank you very much and have a nice week.